what do you dream of being as a child? Like some children, I dreamt of an astronaut, something I am still very passionate about today at 17 years old. I aspire to travel across our solar system and maybe one day live on Mars. I have a strong internal desire for the unknown. I'm fascinated by uncharted paths and the adventures they lead to. The prospect of exploration lights me up. My journey of rocket design and creation started back in elementary school. I remember in grade three, I did this project where I built a space shuttle. This was the first time I really got interested in space exploration and it's stuck with me since. My desire to overcome challenges has recently set me on a path to build and launch my own rockets. In grade 10, I decided to build a scaled model of NASA's space launch system. Building this rocket took me much longer than expected, but hey, if it wasn't behind schedule, would it really be a proper aerospace project? <laughs> Several months later, I had a four and a half foot tall model of the SLS. However, there's an issue. To build it, I used every, whatever materials I could easily get my hands on, things like poster tubes and dollar store supplies, leading to a model that wasn't correctly scaled to size. Fortunately, I thought a solution which only cost me $600, a 3D printer. This was a life changer. I now had control over all the dimensions and could build my design to scale. I researched, designed, and printed my new model. This lasted for about two months until I switched projects. I now have a beautiful collection of cylinders doing a great job sitting around and collecting dust. The new project I'm focusing on is to build rockets to launch rather than for display. As a kid, I never played with model rockets, so I had no idea what I needed to incorporate into my designs. Despite this, Recon, my first ever model rocket, launched earlier this year. Since this is my first rocket, I did a lot of research into rocket motors, parachutes, fin and nose cone designs, and even the physics equations. My goal was to launch Recon up to 600 feet. I recreated my rocket design in a 3D software, and finally it was time to 3D print it. Recon is comprised of three components, which in total took almost 40 hours of print. I once assembled, it stood a mighty 18 inches tall. Check out how the launch went. Looking back on this launch, I noticed two big mistakes. That's one of the things I love about building rockets. With each launch, you can learn from all your mistakes. Mistake number one, I picked a launch location with trees on two sides and a busy road on the third. <laughs> As you can imagine, that'd be an issue. Mistake number two, I arrived on a windy day. All the red flags were there telling me not to launch, but my excitement caused me to ignore them, which resulted in my rocket ending up 40 feet up in a tree. And we all thought cats are notorious being stuck in trees, right? I had to come back each day for an entire week until the rocket came down. All it took was a parachute full of water and a windstorm. Recon is one stubborn rocket. In the end, it technically had a flight time of six days from lift off to touchdown. I personally think that's pretty impressive. <laughs> By building and launching my own rockets, I have learned way more than I could have from Google. I've invested many hours designing my own creations, and I've learned that failing is okay. There are many times when all my designs fail, but each failure is an opportunity to learn something new. As we can see with SpaceX, the best way to build a rocket is to keep trying even when it fails. This just involves crashing a few in the process. I love that video. <laughs> My rocket career didn't end there. Since Recon, I've built five more rockets. Recon's been the most successful despite ending up in a tree. The next rocket to launch was Recon 2, with minor changes to the previous version. I don't think the parachute and the rocket got along very well. During the launch, the parachute and the nose completely separated from the rest of the rocket. After this, I won the challenge myself even more, so I started messing around with multi-stage rockets. I mean, there are two or more stages, and each stage contains its own motor. So when that motor burns out, that stage separates and the next motor above it ignites. My first multi-stage rocket was Scout 1. The design process is similar, so I'm bored with the details. However, there's an issue, again. You know when you're driving and your side mirror reads, objects in mirror are closer than they appear. Well, objects on my 3D design software appear bigger than they are. On my screen, I looked at the section for the parachute and thought, that's tons of room to fit a parachute. It turns out, it really wasn't. So the little gap in the middle there was for the parachute on the outside. During the launch, the parachute got scorched by a second stage motor. And here's the video.
Whoa, that went really high. Nice. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that worked really well. Again, there's room for improvement, leading us to Scout 2, aka the rocket that forgot which way to go. Scout 2 is a three-stage rocket containing three motors. This is by far my favorite launch, but also the biggest failure. Check it out. So, what the heck happened there? Well, to state the obvious, the rocket went the wrong, wrong direction, almost hit me, and the stages didn't separate. But on a more technical level, there were a couple issues as well. Firstly, the rocket's mass was too heavy for the motor I used, leading to a very slow acceleration. And secondly, the rocket wasn't built very stable, which caused it to launch like this instead of straight up. Scout 2 is the most complex rocket I've launched. And as I mentioned in Scout 1, there is no room for a parachute. So I spent about four hours engineering and testing a solution to this issue. After three failed attempts, I came up with a completely brand new system. My brilliant idea was to have the parachute come out of the bottom of the rocket instead of the top. Like NASA, I gave the system a name using the acronym RDS, which stands for Rear Deployment System. Unfortunately, Scout 2 still wasn't able to launch successfully. I'm honestly hoping for one of rockets just to blow up one day. That would sure mix things up. Yeah. Now getting to the fun part, the more powerful rockets I've worked on. Last year, my school, my school started a makerspace club, which morphed into a rocketry club. We had just one month left to build and launch a rocket. I think we did pretty good. Look how far we got. It's, it's a pretty good rocket with the whole body tube there. Yeah. This is what we actually put together. Sadly, we ran out of time, so the launch date's been set for this year. This is the heaviest rocket I've worked on using a very powerful motor. So powerful, I've never considered that motor before. To put it in perspective, that motor would launch recon to over 3,500 feet. In reality, it only went 600 feet. The Rocket Club of my school is how I'm spreading my passion for rocketry throughout the community. I think when you're passionate about something you love, you need to share it with others. So far, I've only talked about, talked about rockets small enough to carry. Well, now let's scale things up to an interplanetary level. To give you a brief history of what the human race has accomplished, a key date in the world's space exploration is October 1957. And that's the day that the Soviet Union launched the very first artificial satellite. This is, this is the event that ignited the space race, which ended when the US landed a man on the moon in 1969. However, there are many other significant events what if I told you all those, we'd be here all day? And I mean all day. You know what's crazy? If you were born any time after 1999, there have been astronauts continuously living and working in space for just as long or longer than you've been alive for. Wow. This has only been possible because of the International Space Station. The ISS is a collaboration between 60 nations across the world. The big players are Russia, Canada, US, and Japan. This is amazing. On Earth, it wouldn't be feasible to have all these nations working together on one collective project. However, in space, all of this changes. Going back in time, a common trend was desire for exploration. In history, there have been many explorers that ventured away from home. People like Marco Polo and Christopher Columbus. And guess what they want? They want to explore the unknown. The same desire is what allowed us to build the ISS. All nations want to explore the universe, but not all have the resources to do it. My mom thinks it's crazy that I want to travel to Mars, but I would sign up without hesitation. Like other explorers and astronauts, I have a strong internal desire for the unknown. I found this quote by George Bernard Shaw. He said that people who say it cannot be done should not interrupt those who are doing it. Imagine what society would be today if everyone was frightened at the idea of doing something unknown. It's likely that we would never have been to space. I'm not sure about you, but that idea frightens me. The next step for the human race is to travel back to the moon and then on to Mars. NASA compared their Apollo program to a camping trip. The missions were under two weeks, including seven days for travel. We didn't spend much time on the moon, and this makes it hard to study the effects of space travel on the human body. The ISS has been working to develop new key technologies to allow us to travel further and safely out into space. In order to prepare for conditions on Mars, people need to live and work in a deep space environment. NASA's newest program, the Artemis program, aims to land the first woman and next man on the lunar surface by 2024. As part of this program, NASA is planning to build a new space station called Gateway which will launch in early 2020s. Gateway will be assembled in lunar orbit and provide humans with many essential benefits. Firstly, it will grant us easy access to lunar surface. Secondly, it will allow us to work in a deep space environment. And thirdly, it, will, it can be used as a pit stop for spacecraft on the way to Mars in the future. Earlier I mentioned how the Apollo program was like a camping trip. Well now Gateway will allow us to move into town and become close neighbors with our moon. What's special with Gateway is that NASA is not the only organization working on it. 
all nations that are part of the ISS are contributing as well as commercial companies. And what's more, NASA even asked aerospace companies to develop possible ideas for Gateway and the Moon Lander. This is very interesting because it shows how space technology has advanced to the point where commercial companies are almost leading the way. NASA is not the only organization going back to the moon. SpaceX is right there alongside with them. Since SpaceX is a commercial company and not restricted by government funding, they have been able to make further progress on new technology for moon and Mars landings. Earlier I showed you some of SpaceX's failed landings. Well, now let's look at some of the more successful ones. NASA's never tried to land the first stage of any of their boosters before. And this shows how far SpaceX has come since they started in just 2002. Now linked with their newest rocket, the change is unbelievable. Meet Starship. Starship will be a fully reusable two-stage rocket. The first stage will launch and land in a similar way like the Falcon booster like in the video, while the second stage continues onto either the Moon or Mars and lands on its surface. Now what's amazing about Starship is that it has the capability to refuel using resources found on the lunar and Martian surfaces. Then the second stage will launch, return to Earth, and land just like the first one. My intuition tells me that a human's final land on Mars is fast approaching. It's safe to say that SpaceX will probably beat NASA. And I think, it, I think this is a positive sign that commercial companies are becoming more efficient and technologically advanced. If we continue waiting for NASA to, to get funding, we may never leave our solar system. And it might sound like we've accomplished a lot when talking about space exploration, but in reality, we've only seen 4% of the entire universe. 4%. That's really not a lot. And it sure seems like future astronomers have their work cut out for them. I want to be part of the exploration. I want to go to new frontiers and be able to look back and see a little blue bubble of life floating in the distance. My idea of becoming an astronaut is not just simply a childhood dream, but it's a goal that I plan to passionately pursue. However, as young children or even adults, we shouldn't stop ourselves from pursuing dreams and ideas that make us feel fulfilled, purposeful, or just simply happy. I almost get hit by rockets and sometimes they, sometimes they come crashing down. But that's what makes it exciting. What I'm saying is this. Whatever you're passionate about, go and do it. Do it even if you look goofy and even if you fail a few times. I want to leave you all with one challenge. The next time you have the option to do something unknown, do it no matter how scared you are and persevere past any failures and difficulties along the way. This is the only reason that we've accomplished everything we have, and it's the same idea that's allowed me to be here presenting today. Thank you. <laughs>